So, um, uh, if you don't know what that's about, that's okay, because the Word of God is always pertinent to where we are. 1 Corinthians 14, Paul gives guidelines for how we're to function when the congregation gathers together. And uh, I know for some of you, some of the experience last week uh, may have been the first time you've experienced anything like that. And uh, I'm glad that, uh, that you weren't afraid and tried to jump through any windows. <laughs> we don't have no we windows. We don't have any windows there. That could be rather painful. There's some small ones in the back. You might, have, you might as well go out the door if you can do that. Um, but you know, this is all part of us walking together and learning to live with one another in the kingdom of God and recognizing and appreciating the various views and gifts that we have. So in 1 Corinthians 14.1, Paul starts out talking to his friends at Corinth. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. It's not working. Okay. We'll give up on that one. Send it back to the burial ground where all electronics go. I'm not sure where that is, but anyway, okay. Um, no, no, that's okay. I'll, I'll probably just pretty much stand right here. This is going to be... Believe it or not, it's going to be... I don't believe that. <laughs> I said pretty much, Jim, okay? <laughs> Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue, as happened last meeting, does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But the one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. So uh, the one who speaks in the tongue edifies himself. The one who prophesies edifies the church. I hope that you've grown past that image that prophecy is just about foretelling the future. Sometimes those elements are included. But prophecy, biblically speaking, is actually proclaiming the Word of God. And as I've discussed with you over our three and a half years together, I have the gift of prophecy. God has called me to proclaim the scriptures. Uh, now, back in June, I had no problem telling you that I could prophesy that it's going to be hot in central Arizona. <laughs> it turned out that it was. How about that? Wow. Uh, I could prophesy to you here at the end of October to say we're not done with all the hot days, but it is going to cool down. No, you, you see, this image that we have that prophecy is always about foretelling the future. You can miss what prophecy really means. Proclaiming God's work. That's what God's called me to do. In fact, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 4 is what happened to me. One of those places, everybody says, oh, you got, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit came on you, spoke in other tongues. Well, we're going to see in this passage of Scripture that that's not exactly accurate. What happened to me is what happened to the people in Acts 4 when they got filled with the Holy Spirit, they proclaimed the Word of God with boldness. And that has been what God has called me to do. And for about 35 years after coming out of being a traditional pastor, I have been proclaiming the Word of God with boldness, and thereby I've been invited to leave some churches, and some people have disfellowshipped <laughs> us. But you know what? That comes with what God's called me to do. Woe is me if I don't do what He says to do. And Paul says in Galatians 1, if I were still trying to please men like when he was a Pharisee as a religious leader, he said, I wouldn't be the bondservant of Christ. Most pastors in America today, they and their families, and especially the pastor and wives, are miserable because they try to please everyone in the congregation. Let me tell you, that's not only a miserable place to be, it's not where God wants people that have been called to speak God's word to be. Because if you're trying to please men, Paul tells us in Galatians 1, you're not a bondservant of Christ. You may be a bondservant of a denomination or a set of theological teachings, but you're not a bondservant of Christ. And so, and by the way, that doesn't mean that everything I know and everything I share is absolutely true. That's why uh, the Lord gave you this suggestion about the bucket, the pot you can set on the back of the stove. And, uh, and if something troubles you, that hopefully we have enough love and respect for each other that we can at least put it in the pot and say, God, I think Rick's off base here, but I'm going to 
Put it here and you show me whether it's true or not. And if he doesn't show you, don't receive it. And we'll get along just fine. Amen. So here, the proclaiming, the proclamation is for edifying, for exhortation, for consolation. Are these the only things that, that people need? Uh, edification, exhortation, consolation. Not necessarily. But verse 3 is telling us this is the objective when the congregation gathers. You need to understand that. It's, he's talking about in the context, it's when the congregation gathers. See, it's like you can take that passage from John and say, oh, there's nothing that we do outwardly or physically. No use singing to God. Don't pray out loud. Uh, you know, don't rebuke unclean spirits out loud or whatever because the flesh profits nothing. But that's a misapplication of what Jesus was saying. It was in the context. And of course, it's very significant because there are many people deceived in their relationship with God because they think by participating in a ceremony such as this today that they've got some standing with God. That's where Jesus says the flesh profits nothing because God is wanting to deal with your heart. And until your heart gets right, no matter what other things you may do, it's not worthwhile. Now, when the congregation is gathered, the objective should be edification, exhortation, consolation. And as I think many of us saw last week, politics has no place in this room, okay? Yeah. We're going to leave that part out. That's not what God wants us to be about. As a matter of fact, your opinions and what you want to see happen is not what's to dominate when we gather together here. Yeah. The objective, I remind you, as I've been saying for three and a half years as your pastor, my job as pastor is not to run the church. That's not my job. But it is my job to see to it that you don't run the church with your agenda. Amen. Okay? Amen. Now, and if you think I'm being arrogant, no, listen, I'm not being arrogant. I doubt that there have been more than a handful of meetings that we've had here, and we're somewhere in around the area of 175 meetings where I've been here with you, uh, Sunday meetings. I doubt that there are more than a dozen or so where everything went the way I thought it should go. <laughs> Not bad, 10 or 12 out of 175. But you see, that's because my objective isn't to get you to do what I want you to do. My objective is to try to discern, God, what are you doing with the people that are here today? And when we come to read Scripture or we come to pray or you share a testimony, our, what should be foremost in our mind is, is this going to be good for edification, for exhortation, for consolation, you know, because those who are suffering, we weep with those who are weeping, the scripture says. We've done a lot of that in our household this year, you know. My wife's sister, who is my age, went on to be with the Lord just a few weeks back. Painful, painful thing. After two years ago losing her baby brother to a sudden heart attack at age 55. And you know what? You have offered us consolation. Thank you for that. Some of that ministry has happened to us here. Two Sundays ago, my mother-in-law was here and, and uh, her brother's kids, uh, you know, he had five children at home when he passed and, and uh, his widow was here with us and we got to offer some encouragement and consolation. Yeah, it's been two years, but these are young people and uh, this is a lot for them to assimilate. When we gather, this is what we should be doing. Edifying, exhorting, and encouraging. Now, he says in verse 4 as he goes on, the one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, the one who prophesies edifies the whole body. Now listen to what he says. Verse 5, I wish you all spoke in tongues. Now, I've had people tell me that I don't have the Holy Spirit because I don't have the gift of tongues. Well, you know... <clears throat> People come to me and tell me God teaches them things when I'm speaking. And I'm always humbled because I know that I can't teach you anything. It's the Holy Spirit who teaches you. And we lay hands on the sick and how many amazing, miraculous things have we seen God do? Healing paralysis, healing cancer, uh, healing people with injuries. The things uh, I think that God is working with us right here. I want you to notice Paul recognized that some people don't have that gift. He said, I wish you all had the tongues, but... Even more that you would prophesy, proclaim the word of God. And greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. Now the Baptist tradition from which I have come and my wife has come, they always like to say, ah, greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues. And you're right, Jim. 
I just can't do it. <laughs> because, because, because some, sometimes, oh Jody, hello Jody. She went back in the back. Oh, okay, oh it is on. Okay, I thought it had gone off. So. Again, if this is a blanket statement, then you would say prophecy is always the greatest gift. But wait a minute. What's the context in which he made this statement? He's talking about when the congregation is gathered together, greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues. Now, the reason I know that that's not just a blanket statement that applies everywhere. Let's imagine, and you know, I like... Uh, picturing these things. We hear the screeching of tires, and so we all go running out back, like, what happened out here? And somebody has been thrown out of a car, they're laying on the rocks right at the base of the church sign. If prophecy is always the greatest gift, then, you know, me first, let me get over there. Let's see, you got a ruptured spleen, you got internal bleeding, you got a fractured spine. Uh, you're not going to make it. You need to repent. You're going to die. That's the greatest gift. Let them know they're going to die. You see, in that circumstance, prophecy isn't the greatest gift. What's the greatest gift at that moment? Joni, could you give me a little more volume, please? What's the greatest gift at that moment? Love. Healing. Healing. Praying for healing. That, that's what we need. I'm not going to run out there and say, everybody out of the way, I'm going to use my gift for them. I'm going to say, who's got the gift of healing? We need some healing right here. I'll join with you. I'll agree with you. But at that moment, when someone is suffering and their body's broken, the greatest gift is healing. So again, folks, I'm hoping that maybe your level of understanding what the Scripture means and what it says is being raised a little bit. Because you can take the words of Jesus and you can build yourself a whole new denomination out of it. We don't need any more denominations and the more dividings. What we need is some people coming together around the Word of God. So it's important that we understand contextually what is he talking about. And what he's talking about right here, what he's talking about is when the body is gathered, the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless the person who speaks in tongues it interprets or someone is there with the gift of interpretation that can, can do that. In verse 6 he says, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge, or of prophecy, or by teaching. Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they don't produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what's being played on the flute or the harp? If the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what's spoken for you'll be speaking into the air? There are perhaps a, a great many kinds of languages in the world and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be to the one who speaks a barbarian and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me, to you, uh, to me. Verse 12. So also you, since you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the body. Therefore let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. And if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. We have a number of people who have a gift of tongues, and, uh, and they spend a lot of time praying in tongues. And they describe it the same way. I don't really know what I was praying, but it's what the Lord wanted me, the Spirit of the Lord moved me to pray. So what's the outcome, verse 15? I shall pray with the Spirit, Paul says, and I'm also going to pray with my mind. We're going to pray for Gary Benson, you know, as Stephanie has shared. We're, we're going to pray for him. We're going to pray for Bruce and Shirley Jordan and, and Jim and Janet Dickerson, all three couples in Florence Gardens who are not with us today because of the physical battles that they're, they're having. We can pray for them in the Spirit, those of you who have that gift. And those of us that don't will pray with our mind and will cry out to God and ask for God's intervention in the crises in which they find themselves. So um, I'll pray with the Spirit. And then he says, by the way, I'll sing with the Spirit. I'll also sing with my mind. In verse 16, I love that. Jesus is the cornerstone. 
We selected that because of this communion day. And you remember that even though he's the cornerstone from which the whole temple of God is being built, he was rejected by who? He wasn't rejected by the Jews. He was rejected by the religious leaders. The stone which the builders rejected, God chose him as the cornerstone. And so he says in 16, Otherwise, if you bless in spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of ungifted say amen at the giving of your thanks, since he doesn't know what it is you're saying? For you're giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. You remember verse 3, what happens in the gathering is for edification, exhortation, consolation. Verse 18, Paul says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church, now, he's talking about when the congregation is gathered in the large group meeting, I desire to speak five words with my mind that I may instruct others also, rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. So he's making a very strong point here that even though he has this gift when the congregation is gathered, he would rather speak five words that people could recognize and understand that could minister some truth and life to them rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, you need to understand that's when the congregation is gathered together. Sometimes when people's hearts are broken and we're trying to pray for them, probably the best thing you can do is pray in the Spirit for them. And, and the presence of the Holy Spirit will come and bring comforting and will bring peace to them and will help heal that part of their soul that's suffering. And so it depends on the circumstance. Now I've had some say, well, Rick, you know, uh, we should, you shouldn't have you know, a prepared message and get up and do that from the congregation. It should just be open. Everybody, everybody can share. Well, we always try to give priority to time. If you have a scripture or a testimony you want to share, we want to make room for that. But understand, this gathering has some specific purposes. We have fellowships in homes. We have... Bible study in Florence. We now have the one in Superior. I'm so delighted about that. And, uh, and then we have our prayer time on Tuesdays in the prayer room back here. And then on Wednesday night, we're doing a little different study and praying for the sick. And uh, hopefully you're getting together and having fellowship with one another at other times as well. So you see, there's always an appropriate time, an opportunity for you to share what the Lord is doing with you. Now, it is important that you know that I know that this old thing that many of us were raised with is the expert standing up here and you need to sit down and shut up. Okay? That your job is to sit on the pew and be a spectator. <clears throat> That's not the way the kingdom of God works. Okay? Now, I will do the best I can to do my part, but we give a lot of time to singing songs. I don't know about you, but all week long I sing the songs that we've been singing on Sunday. Does that happen to anybody besides me? Yeah, okay. And some of them you may not, you know, you may not know the words. You can, you can go and try to dig them out or, or we'll be happy. Jody will be happy to make you a copy of some of the words that you want. Some of them, by the way, you can go to uh, the website and you'll see songs and you can go hear some of them online uh, for those of you that spend a lot of time uh, on the computer. So we have a variety of opportunities. But when this is getting, oh, by the way, I think we should discuss everything about politics. I do. Not in this meeting, okay? All right? Not in this meeting. Because my walk with Jesus affects my understanding of what's going on in American society. And I hope that you understand that we are in a war for the soul of America. And much American leadership is trying to drive God into the ditch and out of Main Street. Let me tell you, those of us who were in elementary school in the, in the 60s, we remember the big problem in the 60s was... Chewing gum and shooting spit wads. <laughs> My brother-in-law was teaching at, a, at a, a school in Austin, Texas. They had to have armed security guards in the school every day. It's sad. And we need to have enough discernment to say, oh, those people in the 60s that said we need to throw off all Christianity and those principles, we need to throw all of that stuff away. We got a better way. Somebody needs to hold them accountable for the mess that they've made in our society. Now, there's always stuff wrong with our country. There always has been. By the way, i got news for you. There always will be. But we have a responsibility to pray for our leaders. The Scripture says to do that. And we're going to do that. 
And we're going to ask God to give them wisdom, maybe even beyond their own capabilities or whatever their other motives may be. But all through Scripture, we're exhorted to pray for our leaders. I think we should discuss all those things, not in this setting, okay? And if you have found something uh, health-wise that's really helped you out, that's great if you're in a conversation with somebody you want to talk to them about it. We're not going to have sales pitches for for any, any kind of a program or something that someone's doing here. We're here to talk about Jesus, and our gathering is for exhortation and consolation and encouragement that we will continue walking on with the Lord. Amen. Now, once in a while, when that happens, you're going to have somebody who is a little naive or immature, and their flesh might get in control. Once in a while, you have you know somebody that's kind of full of their opinions, and they want to get up and... You know, uh, and take 45 minutes to tell you about it. I kind of had to butt heads with a fellow on a Tuesday night over at the windmill one night. He wanted to explain to us all about creation and his understanding of exactly how God did things. And I kept trying to stop him. And I finally had to get adamant with him. And the gentleman's name was Dave. I said, Dave, I'm curious about your views. But look around. These people's eyes are glazing over out here. Because he wanted to talk about astronomy and he wanted to talk about geology and, and so forth like that. That wasn't the subject of our Bible study. So you see, being in tune with the Lord Amen. and allowing Him to lead us. And if He moves you to share something, we want to hear it. Okay. But just be aware, we'll finish the last half of this, uh, two-thirds of this uh, scripture next week. There also is correction sometimes that has to be administered when people speak and it's not what the Lord wants spoken. That's when the burden falls on me. So you guys do it right, would you? So I don't have to do it. <laughs> okay. And, and, and when, you, when you screw up, you know what? I'm going to love you. You're my brother, my sister. And when I screw up, I hope that you'll do the other thing. And not run me out of uh, a town on a, you know, a rail or something like that. Lord, thank you for your word. It is life to us. It's medication to our bones. It's healing to our bodies. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And when we tuck this word away in our hearts, it'll cause us to walk in the light as you're in the light. So Jesus, today, I pray that we've understood. We need you, Jesus. And thank you for your sweet spirit, the comfort of the great comforter who comes. To comfort us through all the trials of life. And you said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. God, there are times I've walked away from you and you let me go. But you've never been the one who initiated a separation. <laughs> it was always me. And thank you, like the father of the prodigal son. That you're always looking to see that we'll come back to you with all our heart. And Lord, I think it's the only time in the Bible where you got in a hurry. Jesus never got in a hurry. But Jesus, on that day, when the Father saw the Son, He ran to welcome Him back. Thank you, Jesus. That's the way you are with us. So I pray for each one here. I don't know where each individual is in their heart, Lord, but you know every intimate detail. You've loved them before the foundation of the world. And I pray that today they've been listening to your word and recognizing some truth so that they might make their relationship right with their spouse, with their family members, with their fellow man as much as is possible. And for those that choose to be at odds with us, Lord, we bless them and we pray for you to deal with their hearts and draw them to yourself. Thank you, Jesus, for your sweet presence that's been here with us today. We know you don't live in this room, but you do come in in the hearts of people that are focused on you and that are seeking you. And thank you that we get an extra touch of your presence. Even though we know you're everywhere in the world at once, we get an extra measure when we gather together. Thank you for that, Lord. And now may your peace be on us as we go from this place to love our neighbors as ourselves. And by loving our neighbors, showing Lord God Almighty that we love you with all our heart. I pray in Jesus' name.